Good morning, everybody. Welcome to DUMC. We're so glad you're here worshiping with us. I'm Aaron Hale. I'm the worship leader here, and this is the band. We're glad to see you. Won't you stand and join us as we sing together? We're going to sing Who Breaks the Power of Sin and Darkness. Here we go. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. And you would take my place. chaos back into order. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun.
coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the king of The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Let's sing it again. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Yeah. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, fighting our battles, and every For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. one of the pastors here if you wouldn't mind if you could squeeze in towards the center of your row we still got a few people coming in so that they'll have an easy place to sneak in and sit uh, well welcome to worship it's good to be with you this morning all right we're a little quiet are we okay everybody all right out there uh we're so ex I don't know about you, but I'm really excited to be here this morning. Uh, there's a lot going on, uh, a lot of logistics happening in the worship service. Uh, all you get not just one pastor this morning, not two pastors, not even three, but four pastors are going to preach. Uh, don't worry, you'll still get out on time to go to Sunday school. You won't be here all day. Uh, but this is a special Sunday where we celebrate the baptism of our Lord and get an opportunity to come forward and remember our own baptism. Uh, the grace that God extends to us, maybe for some of us before we could claim that grace for ourselves, uh, that God has claimed each one of us as God's own. I would invite you to reflect on that grace that you have received this morning as we go through this worship service. 
Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite you to stand and turn and greet your neighbor with the love and the peace of Christ. As we continue in worship, hear these words from Psalm 66. Come and hear, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Let's worship together. you stand and join. Let's see, come ye sinners. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Is Jesus ready? Stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. Come, you thirsty. Come, you thirsty. Come and welcome God's free bounty. Glorify true belief and true repentance and every grace that brings you nigh. I will arise, I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. Savior, oh, there are ten thousand charms. Let's see, come ye weary, come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined. Fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. I will arise, I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, and in the arms of my dear Savior. There are ten thousand charms. I will arise. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. And in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Would you pray with me? God of healing and God of wholeness, we bring our brokenness and our sinfulness, our fears and our despair, and we lay them at your feet. 
we reach out our hearts and our hands and our minds and our souls to feel your touch and to know the peace that only you can bring. God of comfort and God of hope, in your presence and power, grant us faith and confidence that here at your feet and in your hands, brokenness lives. Brokenness, broken lives, excuse me, broken lives are made whole. God, this morning as we worship, we also want to lift up those in our community who are hurting and grieving, and we ask that you remind them of your love and you bring them comfort right now. We lift up Jessica and Justin Ferguson on the death of Jessica's mother, Gail Smith Gass, as well as Phil Haverfield on the death of his wife, Suzette. Lord, bring peace and comfort in their time of mourning. And we also celebrate with all those who are celebrating in our community as well. We thank you so much for your blessings, Lord. Lord, we know that true healing is more than restoration of flesh and blood or knitting of bone to bone. We know that true healing is wholeness where body and soul and spirit unite. True healing is peace, the knowledge of your presence, a hope that knows no end. Lord, we know that true healing cries out, Father, not your will, but ours, but yours. Not my will, but yours. Goodness. <laughs> true healing knows love perfectly, a love that casts out all fear. True healing overcomes and endures forever. So God, we arise and we come. We come to you. We come to your healing waters and we ask you to cover us with your restorative power and grace. Heal us and make us whole, body, heart, mind, and soul. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, your son, and we lift up the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing that chorus together. I will arise. I will arise and go to Jesus He will embrace me in His arms And in the arms of my dear Savior Oh, there are 10,000 charms Amen. You guys can be seated. Well, good morning. morning. It's a little different up here today, but today in 1920, back in 1929, a second child was born to a pastor and his wife here in Atlanta, Georgia. One source said that the child, when he was born, did not cry out, and they wondered if the child was stillborn, but eventually that child found his voice. And they named him Martin Luther King Jr. And his voice continues to echo from the red clay hills of Georgia. Today we gather to talk about baptism on this baptism of our Lord Sunday. To try and answer some questions that people might have about baptism. I was at home Monday night watching some sort of football game. When a friend of mine called and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on my sermon. He said, what is your sermon about? I said, I'm talking about baptism. And he asked, are you for it or against it? (laughs) 
And I said, I'm for it. I think people ought to be baptized. I think baptism is a good thing. But it got me to thinking, why is that the question everybody seems to be asking today? Are you for it or against it? That seems to be the first thing out of people's mouth when whatever we seem to be discussing, are you for it and against it? And I'm not sure that's the best question about baptism because baptism is for us. It is for me. It is for the world. It's something God does in and through us. From the beginning of our lives, the Holy Spirit starts working in us and wooing in us to make a decision for Christ for ourselves, never coercing us, but always inviting us to make a decision for Christ. And people have all sorts of questions about baptism. Uh, I was baptized as an infant. Did that count? I was baptized like Kirby Smart with Gatorade the other night. Does that count? <laughs> Uh, How much water is enough? And what is that prayer that we pray over the water? How does that work? Should it be done in public or in private? So many questions about baptism. One Catholic parishioner had gone to work on the fish fry at his church one Friday morning when he noticed that the priest was also in the kitchen. And he said to the priest, he said, excuse me, you know, why are you here so early, Father? He said, well, I'm preparing the holy water for this week's baptisms. And he was intrigued and said, can I watch you do that? Can I help? And he said, oh, no, it's not a very difficult process. I don't need any help, but you're glad to watch. He said, how do you make holy water? He said, oh, you just boil the hell out of it. (laughs) So many questions about baptism. So many things that we want to know about baptism. When someone gets baptized in this church, I often ask the family the next week, did it work? And people will say things like, oh, yes, my child has been perfect since baptism last week. Or our children have been incredibly well behaved since you baptized them. And I ask one person, did it work? And they're like, not yet. (laughs) But we trust that it will. We pray that it will. And that's the whole idea of the unfolding life in Christ. One of our members went said to me, he said, I was baptized as an infant. And all I have is a baptismal certificate to show for it. What does that mean? And I said, you know what that means? It means someone loved you very much. It means someone loved you so much that they brought you before God and offered you back to God and that God claimed you as his own. And that is a beautiful thing for God to claim us as an infant or as an adult. We think about something dramatic happening to us when it's an adult, like happened to Delmar as he went down to the river to pray. You might remember this. The preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's a straight and narrow from here on out. And heaven everlasting is my reward. Delver, what are you talking about? We got bigger fish to fry. The preacher said all my sins is washed away, including that piggly wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo. I thought you said you was innocent of those charges. Well, I was lying. And the preacher said that that sin's been washed away, too. Neither God nor man's got nothing on me now. Come on in, boys. The water is fine. (sighs) Come on in. The water is fine. I hope that if you have not been baptized, that you will consider it. As we gather to remember our baptism today, here coming to take water and to place it on our forehead, place it on our hearts, on our hands, to remember the baptism that God had for us, that we've been arguing about since the very beginning, as we hear from Matthew, the third chapter, the 13th through the 17th verses. See how John and the Baptist and Jesus are arguing from the very beginning. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the good news according to the Gospel of Matthew. Amen.
thanks be to God for this good news. Jesus has intentionally gone out into the wilderness to humble himself and to be baptized by John. And he says to John, I need you to baptize me. And John says, I'm against it. I can't baptize you. That's not how the way things work around here. And Jesus says, yeah, I've been paying attention to the way how things have been working. And in order to fulfill all righteousness, we need to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Now it springs forth. I need to humble myself and let you baptize me in order to begin to change the world, in order for things to change that we have always been a part of. And then the heavens open and the spirit descends like a dove and a voice comes from heaven and says, this is the all-powerful master of the universe. No, that's not what the voice says. The voice says, you're my child. You're my child. This is my child, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. And there must have been great words to hear because there were some questions about who his daddy was in Nazareth. And so to hear you are my beloved child is a good word. And for those of us who may not have heard those good words at home, they're a wonderful life-affirming word. You are my child, my beloved. With you I am well pleased. In this community, there was a pastor named Dr. Joe Peabody. Some of you may know him. And Joe grew up in a family of boys. And in a family of boys, it was always difficult to know if there were baked goods, if you were going to get one. And sometimes they were not allowed to eat them. They were just put on a plate and they were told you could eat them after supper. So Joe had his own technique. He would grab one of those brownies before dinner and lick it. And he would put it back on the plate and he'd say, this one is mine. This one is mine. That was his way of claiming and marking that brownie. And he went on to say, as he thought about baptism, that's what God does for us. God claims us and marks us as God's own and says, this is my beloved child, whether they've been newly born or born again. I was born into a Methodist family, and I was baptized as a baby, like probably many of you were. I don't remember anything about that day, but that's okay. That's okay. I can still come and remember my baptism because what I know is that my parents loved me so much that they brought me before the faith community and they said yes to the questions that were asked of them. And as a helpless infant who was unable to do anything for myself, God claimed me as his own. That's what we call provenient grace, grace that goes before. God prepares the way of grace for each and every one of us. God claimed me that day as one of God's own, expecting nothing in return because obviously as a baby, there was nothing I could do in return. My baptism was a gift of God's grace. It was an act of God in and through the church. Infant baptism. We get lots of questions about that, mainly from some of those of you that may have grown up in the Baptist church. It's actually an ancient and almost universal practice of the church that dates back to the New Testament period. We are all born into an imperfect world, and we all have a natural inclination to sin. Humans are greedy. We are boastful. We are self-centered. And our sinfulness separates us from God. So we need help. We need help to turn away from that sinfulness and turn back to God. We believe that God has chosen the sacrament of baptism as one of the ways in which that divine love comes to us, a gift of grace. The grace offered to us in baptism is grace made available through the work of Jesus Christ. When we receive baptism, the forgiving, cleansing, saving power of God is applied to each of our lives. 
This is such an important part of God's working with us that when Jesus, the risen Jesus, appeared to his disciples for the last time, he instructed them to go out and to baptize. Our book of discipline, that book that the United Methodist Church has that tells us how to do things, says, because the redeeming love of God revealed in Jesus Christ extends to all persons, and because Jesus explicitly included the children in his kingdom, the pastor of each charge or church shall earnestly exhort all Christian parents or guardians to present their children to the Lord in baptism at an early age. If parents don't intend to raise their baby, their child, in a faith community, it's not an appropriate use of the baptismal covenant. If parents are baptizing their children only to ensure salvation, we know that salvation is a free gift of God made possible by the work of Christ. So if a parent is having their child baptized to make sure they're saved or out of a sense of duty or because their mother or mother-in-law told them to do it, <laughs> that, is not, that is not a good use of the baptismal covenant, friends. At Dunwoody United Methodist Church, parents of the children coming forward who can't answer for themselves or adults who want to be baptized meet with one of the clergy. Typically, it's the clergy person who is doing the baptism. And we explain what the questions are that will be asked of you when you present your child or when you present yourself for baptism. We explain what they mean and we answer any questions. It's expected that when the children are older, if they're baptized as infants, that they will take part in confirmation. And in confirmation, they will learn the answers to the questions and what that means. And then after they've spent time studying what it means, they will be asked those very same questions. And if they answer yes, they will be confirmed in the church. It is their time to profess their faith for themselves. Adults who are baptized for the first time in the United Methodist Church, we don't rebaptize, friends, because God's work works forever. He doesn't make mistakes. And we accept baptisms from other denominations. So those adults who come to us for the first time to be baptized also make promises or vows by answering the very same baptismal questions asked by the clergy. The first vow recognizes and renounces evil in all its forms, systemic and personal. The second promise asserts that God enables us to be victorious over evil and obligates us then to work actively in our lives to overcome and oppose sin in the society in which we live. And then the third vow, we affirm our commitment to Christ. We acknowledge that the authentic church of Christ is inclusive of all people, every person born. When parents and sponsors reaffirm these vows, they speak for themselves, not on behalf of their children. The final question that's asked of parents who bring forward a child who is unable to answer for themselves is this. Will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, he or she may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves? to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Here, the parents are making a promise to bring up the child in the church and to teach them by word and example what it means to be a Christian. Until they're old enough to make that profession for themselves. 
And because Christianity is not lived out in isolation, but in community with other Christians, the congregation then reaffirms its own faith and commitment and promises to nurture, teach, and support those whose commitments are being affirmed. Friends, the sacrament of baptism is the sign of God's ongoing promise of ongoing grace forever, offering continual forgiveness and transformation throughout our entire lives. At whatever age it is received, baptism demonstrates our inclusion in the covenant with God. And it, in, it includes our ability to receive divine grace. That a divine grace that claims us, sustains us, and saves us. Thanks be to God. As Kathy has already mentioned, uh, baptism is one of the two sacraments of the United Methodist Church. And it serves as an outward and a visible sign of the change that takes place in the individual who is coming to be baptized. It is a public affirmation of the initiation that each of us has into the community of faith. By our baptism, baptism we are welcomed into the body of Jesus Christ, which is called the church. And for our baptism... Uh, we become a church member, a, com a part of that community as we are initiated into it, but we also become a Christian follower of Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul tells us in the scriptures, when we become a part of Christ's community, we become one who takes on Christ in our lives. And through that, we become followers of Jesus Christ. And we also become a part of that community, a follower, a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Now, you'll notice that one of the things I said was that this is a public involvement. This is a public initiation that we do. Uh, the clergy are often asked, well, can we just do a private baptism? Uh, this would be an intimate experience for our family. Uh, we would love to do it. That way, and sometimes there are situations and uh, during, COVID. during COVID, and yeah, remember COVID? Yeah. Yes, it's still here. Uh, <laughs> but um, we remember during those special times when something needs to be done, and on behalf of the church, we are able to do it then. But by its very nature, baptism is a community experience. Not only is it important for the person who is being baptized or licked by God, uh, as reminded the day, uh, it is something that's a part of our community as well. In the first stories of the baptism uh, that was taking place in the Gospels, people would gather at the local river, uh, some kind of watering hole that might be there, or a stream or something, but the important thing was that it was living water. It was not water that was stagnant or dirty. It was water that was flowing and living. Living things could live in that water. And for that reason, uh, that is what was used. And the baptism of Jesus was participating in this community that had gathered for baptisms by John. Uh, in the story that is found in the third chapter of, of the Gospel of Matthew, um, we have that it is noticed that the people have come from the whole region. Um, as far away as Jerusalem, this is a part of the Judean wilderness. And so it's, it's all the way to Jerusalem and even into the Galilee, uh, which was a couple of days away. They would come and they would be a part of the baptismal experience. And so Jesus came, and he was baptized by John. And as he came up out of the water, we heard the word proclaimed by God, then acknowledged by God that this is my son. I am in love with him. And for that reason, I am pleased that he has come and done this. And so it's God's announcement uh, about the importance of this act that Jesus himself is doing, and all who are there hear the proclamation. 
It's not a private conversation. It is something. And that's another reason we come in a public way. We hear the proclamation that is done as a community of faith. When someone is baptized in our worship services, the gathered community, as Kathy reminded us, is asked several questions. And in those questions, we proclaim that we are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. We profess our faith in Jesus and that we will remain faithful to him our entire lives. We also reject the sins of the world, uh, our sins and also the sins of the world, for we know we often fall short of God. We promise to continue to serve Christ in this world, not only here in this community, but in God's community of the world. And we also promise that we're going to live Christ-like lives. We're going to set an example for those who are coming to be baptized so they will know how to be faithful followers of Christ. They will know what it means to live a life similar to theirs. And for the one being baptized and for each of us, the church community recognizes that this is a community that will take responsibility for the individual who's coming to be baptized, whether they be children, youth, or adult. They will come and be disciplined in the faith just as each of us has been disciplined in the faith. And the church will provide all that is needed. And then ultimately, we journey together through life with the people that have been baptized. We proclaim that we as a community are going to walk the journey of faith with them both this day and forevermore. Thanks be to God. Okay, so there is this funny, famous story about Constantine. And if you're not as big of a history nerd as I am, Constantine was the Roman emperor who made Christianity the state religion of Rome back in the 5th century. Okay, so Constantine converted to Christianity, and he thought that everybody else should too. Um, but despite this fact... He waited as long as he possibly could to be baptized. He actually waited until he was on his deathbed because he wanted to be able to get as much sinning in as possible. <laughs> and then when he was baptized, he wanted as little time between his baptism and his death as possible just so he didn't undo all that good work, right? He didn't want to have any opportunity to mess it up. Now, that's kind of a funny story, but one of the things that Constantine understood, that we understood about baptism, that we understand about baptism, is that it works to save us through the forgiveness of sin. But the thing that I think he gets wrong, or at least he understands differently than we do today, is that baptism is not some kind of magic ceremony, right? It's not like a sin disinfectant bath. It doesn't just work like that. Instead, it is a physical reminder of the ways that God's Holy Spirit is constantly working to perfect us in love, both in that moment that we're baptized and throughout our entire lives. And the way that we practice baptism here in the United Methodist Church actually drives home that point. So if you've witnessed a baptism here at DUMC in the last year or two, you probably know or you've noticed that before the baptism, the pastor will come and say a blessing over the water. And they, they pray a prayer that starts out like this. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. And in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called the disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. So this prayer, um, which continues after this, but this part is enough to let us know that it is called a flood prayer by people who are worship geeks like me. Um, it's called a flood prayer because it talks about all of the ways that God has worked throughout human history to save humanity through water. 
It was actually written by Martin Luther back in the 16th century. It worked its way into the Book of Common Prayer of the Church of England back in 1662. And because John Wesley was an Anglican, he brought it over to Methodism. And the flood prayer tells this story of how God has worked throughout our history. And it names all of these moments of our interactions with water that bless us with God's grace. From the creation of the universe through to Jesus' own baptism, this prayer reminds us that God's spirit isn't just with us in that moment of baptism, blessing us and cleansing us and then just letting us fend for ourselves, right? Instead, God's spirit is with us constantly and has been moving since the beginning of time, nudging us closer and closer to God and helping to form us into the people that God has created us to be. So as we remember our baptisms today, we're going to hear some of those same stories about the way that God has worked through water to save us. And it's my hope that now, each time you hear the flood prayer in our liturgy, when we baptize a new member of this church family, that will be a chance for you to remember as well, for you to remember your baptism and to remember all of the ways, I swear, I have the weirdest shaped ears. These things just don't want to stay. To remember all of the ways that God does continue to work in your lives too, through water, through grace, through the grace that nurtures us, like the waters of the womb. May it be so. And so friends, I hope we've answered some of the questions you might have about baptism. But if there are others you have, like what does christening mean? Christening is the naming part of baptism, where I say what name is given this child, and you speak the child's name, like christening a ship, naming a ship. Christening is part of baptism, but it is not the whole thing of baptism. Martin Luther, as was alluded to, Martin Luther took great comfort in his baptism. And when he was having a difficult day, he would repeat it over and over to himself. I've been baptized. I've been baptized. I've been baptized. So when you're in a difficult situation this week and you, there are things you know you shouldn't say, just say to yourself, I've been baptized. Or I need to get baptized. I've been baptized. I've been baptized. When I was a little boy, I had a tendency to wander off. I know you can't imagine that. I was supposed to stay in my seat. I didn't do very well. And I wandered off as a, as a little boy. And so my father, because it happened so often, he created a code word for us. Because if I got lost in the Kmart, he didn't want to always say, will Phil Schrader please report to the front? He said, your middle name is Daniel and my middle name is Daniel. His name was Paul. And he said, you'll hear from the loudspeaker, will Dan Paulson please report to the front? Will Dan Paulson please report to the front? And I knew in that moment that however far I had wandered off, my dad was always calling me back into relationship, helping me to remember that I was claimed by him and that I was his own. Baptism is something that we do once, but God always calls us back into that relationship and may be calling you more deeply into that relationship. We were had Bible study here Tuesday morning, and one of the men said, I was baptized as an infant, and then I kind of forgot about it. I mean, it wasn't something I really lived into. I was baptized as an infant, but then there became a moment in my life when things weren't going so well. And he said, I remember praying, God, I need help that only Jesus can give. God, I need the help that only Jesus can give. And in a sense, he activated his baptism in a way that had never been activated before as he allowed the Holy Spirit to live more fully into his life. So friends, come on in. The water's fine. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Friends, as we... Here, I'm going to give this to you, Kathy. As we prepare to respond to the grace that God has shown us, not only through our gathering here and through our baptism, I want to remind you of a couple of ways that you are going to be able to give back. As you can see, there are ways that you can give financially to support the mission and ministries of this church. You can put uh, a donation into the uh, baskets as they are passed here in just a moment. You can also use the QR code to scan and give online if you're a person like me who never has cash. But there are also ways that you can support this church through your presence and your service. One important way that we 
uh, or inviting you to do that here in the next month is by participating in our Night to Shine event, which is going to take place here on February 10th. This is a prom experience, a magical night, a night to shine for members of our wider community with disabilities. We know that it's going to be an awesome time, and we still need volunteers to make this night magical. We also need donations of a few key items. So if you'll just visit DunwoodyUMC.org, you'll find right there on our homepage some of the ways that you can get involved, that you can shine alongside those we're celebrating here. So friends, with this in mind, let us continue our worship as we remember our baptism. Water on which God breathed, and the Spirit brooded when God began creating us. This water covered the earth deeper than the Himalayas when God wanted to start over. This is the foot of the rainbow that's meant to tell us God won't destroy creation again. This is the water of our Maker's promise. This is the water that opened at, at Moses' command when God led God's people out of slavery. This is the water which, by which Miriam and the women danced the rhythms of liberation. These are the waters of Babylon by which our ancestors sat down and wept their harps and tongues silent from homesickness. This is the water that marks us as God's own. Out of this water, John pulled a stunned Jesus in the River Jordan. The day they saw the dove and heard from deep within the voice that said, You are my beloved. In you my heart sings for joy. This is where those men heaved and hauled nets until love came to town and called them to even harder work for even less pay. This is the well in Samaria where Jesus chatted unchaperoned with a so-called disreputable woman. This is the living water that quenched her thirst forever and restored her dignity. This is the water that calls us into life and relationship. These are the tears that fell. To the tears that fell that last night in the garden, this is the sink that Pilate used to wash his hands when he passed the death sentence. This is what Jesus thirsted for at the hour of his death. And this is the tomb from which Christ blasted. This is the opening. This is the way. This is the water that binds us to God when shame and sin and death are destroyed. This is the water that reminds us of who we are and of whose we are. Friends, this water is not magic, but it is special. Though it's only ordinary water, it helps us to remember the extraordinary love that God has for us. So whether you have been baptized or not, this water here represents God's constant, never-ending presence with us and our power to claim God's love, to do creative, kind, and compassionate things that bring peace and justice into the world. As you come forward here in just a moment, you will have the opportunity to touch the water as a reminder of God's love for you. You may choose to pray afterwards if you'd like, and you can come to one of these three stations after the baskets of offering have passed your seat. You do not need to be a member of this church. You do not need to even be baptized. No matter what, this water is a symbol of God's grace and a sign that you are God's beloved child. So friends, let us continue our worship together as we give our gifts and remember our baptisms.
God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. Dead man walking, slave to sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me under, baptize. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like hope. forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. God, I need it every day. It's 
It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. It's like holy like holy water on my skin. so we give thanks for God's amazing love and the cleansing waters of baptism, how they cleanse us from sin and bring us into new life with God and with one another. So look at your neighbor now and tell him, I'm baptized, or at least I remember mine. <laughs> because baptism is not something to be for or against. It is God's word that says, I am for you. And when God is for us, who can be against us? Will you stand and lift your voices in our benediction song as we go forth praising God this day? I forgot. We have new members who are coming to join the church. And uh, the Beasleys are coming. And you got to sit back down. Sorry. Uh, you know, you're getting your exercise today. And uh, their son, Caleb, at least, is going to join me up on the stage. I don't know if anybody else is. Y'all, the rest of you coming all the way up here? It's a lot higher than it used to be. Caleb, um, and I've got my wrong list here, but um, these are the Be Beasleys, and uh, Caleb and Elizabeth, Libby, yeah, there you go, Andy and Jen, uh, they are new to the area, moved here in August fr uh, from Greenville, they've really enjoyed the church, everything from soccer to basketball and choir, Caleb and Elizabeth uh, have started at Austin Elementary in second and third grade. Uh, Jen went to the University of North Florida for undergrad, double majored in poli-sci and psychology, worked with foster children and, and the dependency court before attending graduate school for counseling, and has worked uh, comp compassionately in the field of eating disorders for over 10 years, wow. and now leads a team of therapists as, right at a treatment center. Mm -hmm. We're grateful for your work. Let's say thank you. Yeah. Andy went to the Naval Academy. Any others out there? Okay, uh -oh. Uh -oh. And, and, and later got his MBA at GWU and works for Michelin. They live in the branches and look forward to getting more involved in men's and women's ministry here and adult Bible study. So I'll ask you, as you have already remembered your baptism, will you live out your faith through this community, through Dunwoody United Methodist Church, and uphold it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? We will. We welcome you as the newest members of the Dunwoody United Methodist right. Church. Caleb, what do you think about being up here? Uh, I think it's okay. You think it's okay? <laughs> welcome. We know that uh, you will be a blessing to us, and we hope to be a blessing to you as we stand together and lift our voices in our benediction song. If you guys will have a seat for a second, I just have a quick... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Holy Ghost, hold us
Amen. Go in peace. Have a great week.